and is a past chair of its docent board. He has given hundreds of tours and has collaborated with the museum staff and community partners in the development of its interfaith tour initiative and program. He currently serves as a regional director to the National Docent Symposium Council. Bill is a retired lawyer, a lifelong amateur violinist, and is a passionate chamber musician. Today's recording will be Today's program will be recorded, and this report recording today is for educational purposes only. So please welcome Bill Sitzer and our program today, a virtual tour of the special ex exhibition. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you, Judy, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here, and uh, uh, looks like we have around 30 people on the call. Um, if we were in the uh, galleries, uh, this would be uh, a very large group. Um, we, we try to uh, give these tours uh, at the museum for uh, a group of around 15 uh, so that it can be more interactive. Um, we, we can't really do that uh, virtually like we're going to do this morning. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, we're going to uh, do the best we can to uh, uh, provide you with uh, a safe alternative opportunity uh, to be introduced to the special exhibition uh, that's currently on view at the museum. Uh, for those of you that uh, are comfortable doing so, uh, uh, let, let this serve as an introduction uh, to that uh, exhibition. Uh, so if, if you have questions uh, along the way, um, please put them in the chat and uh, uh, with Judy's assistance, we'll uh, do our best to answer some of those uh, uh, at the end of the program. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be uh, sharing my screen now and I'm going to be handling my own technology. So if there's some delays in uh, providing these uh, slides to you as we go along. Uh, uh, I apologize in advance for that. So, uh, so without further ado, uh, most major art museum exhibitions take years to conceive and bring to fruition. Uh, for example, our recent exhibition of the works of Jean-Francois Millet uh, took 10 years to develop and it brought to St. Louis works from all over the world. Uh, this exhibition came about in just a matter of months because last month museums throughout the world became unable to loan and transport works to one another uh, due to our current pandemic. Uh, so facing this reality, a group of uh, our curators at the museum brought together this exhibition of 120 works by 54 major artists quite quickly, utilizing only works in the St. Louis Art Museum's permanent collection of German art of the last 200 years. It demonstrates uh, the breadth and the depth of our collection. Uh, what was created became a narrative of how through transformative moments in history, artists have produced thought-provoking images reflecting their times that continue to have lasting impact. Uh, this exhibition, which is called The Storm of Progress, German Art After 1800, chronologically highlights the history of German art from Romanticism to the fall of the Berlin Wall, including its industrialization, uh, national unification, World Wars I and II and the Holocaust, and the Cold War and its aftermath. It explores how German art, politics, economics, social issues and history of the 19th and 20th centuries were all connected. 
uh, I prepared this tour initially uh, uh, as a uh, training tour uh, for the docents of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center in collaboration with Dan Rich. And uh, I thought it would be appropriate to retain as much of that information as possible for this particular audience. And so that's really my focus and orientation this morning. So I'm switching slides here, be patient with me. So perhaps uh, no writer articulated these historical challenges uh, at this time more clearly than the, ben than the uh, German Jewish philosopher and essayist, Walter Benjamin, whose meditative writings inspired the title for this exhibition, Storm of Progress. He has an interesting story. In 1933, Benjamin, along with many other Jews, fled Nazi Germany. He settled in France. Uh, with the outbreak of the war in 1939, he was temporarily interned in a French concentration camp. On his release a few months later, he returned to Paris, but in the summer of 1940, he fled before the advancing German army. The last few months of his life reflect the precarious experience of countless Jews in France at the time, a flight to the Spanish border and preparations for immigration by legal or illegal means. Lacking the necessary exit visa from France, he joined a guided party that crossed the Pyrenees to enter Spain as an illegal refugee. Turned back by custom officials, Benjamin took his own life in a small Spanish border town in Catalonia in September of 1940. In his writings, Benjamin imagined history as a powerful storm, a storm he called progress, whose winds propel humanity into an uncertain future. His metaphor captures both the devastation and hope seen in German art in the last 200 years. In his short life, Benjamin was deeply drawn to the work of the Swiss artist, Paul Klee. And much of Benjamin's thinking about art can be traced to his engagement with Clay's Angelus Novus on your screen, a 1920 work which Benjamin owned and frequently called his most treasured possession. This work is now in the collection of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. This work is not a part of this exhibition, but the museum does have a couple of the works of Paul Clay, which I think you would enjoy on another tour. In his 1940 essays on the concept of history, Benjamin describes the image as a fearsome but fragile seraph, aghast and going who knows where, just like history. His eyes are staring, his mouth open, wings spread. Benjamin said, this is how one might picture the angel of history where we might perceive an historical continuum of progress, he also saw one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage, hurled in front of his feet over time. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what had been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from paradise caught in the angel's wings with such violence that he can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into a future to which his back is turned while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. Benjamin called this storm progress, random human events which must be experienced on the road to redemption. 
This exhibition at the St. Louis Art Museum presents works that explore key ideas and events of these times. In the tumultuous 150 years before World War II, the territory of present day Germany had five different governments. Culture rather than nationhood formed the basis of a collective German identity and artists balanced a long history and rich traditions with rapid industrialization and a growing international prominence. In 1871, the German empire was formally established as an independent nature, nation. Think about that. The country of Germany was, in, was formed 100 years after the founding of the United States of America. After 1933, certain German artists were censured and persecuted under the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Some who could fled. Those who stayed witnessed various aspects of the horrific extent of Nazi atro atrocities. Post-war German artists addressed the burden of this legacy, producing artworks that confronted the trauma of war and the memory of the Holocaust. Sometimes their work provoked a German public not ready to face its recent past. After Germany's division into communist East and capitalist West, a Cold War landscape shaped drastic political, social, and economic change. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 ushered in a new era during which artists explored rapidly shifting popular culture and the globalized urban spaces of the emerging millennium. We're going to take a look at a selection of representative works featured in the exhibition. And we'll conclude with one work in our collection, which is on view, but which is not in the exhibition. It certainly could have been. I won't be sugarcoating the subject matter. Some of it is really pretty difficult. I hope that those of you who are able will visit the exhibition and see these works in person there's nothing like seeing the originals and there's so much to see that we won't be able to cover here. So as we've already said, at the start of the 19th century, the modern state of Germany didn't exist. Rather, it was a patchwork of independent territories, including the major states of Prussia, Bavaria and Saxony. Landscape imagery played an important role in constructing the identity of what would become the German nation. Artists traveled extensively to capture the geographical diversity of the German landscape, from the forests and mountains of Saxony to the expansive Baltic coast. Their embrace of nature also offered spiritual and physical renewal at a time of growing industrialization. In this painting by Caspar Friedrich, sunlight bursts over the distant hills as a blue sky dispels gathered storm clouds. If you look carefully, you can see a hut on the left horizon showing a human presence within this vast landscape. This scene is of the Riesengebirge mountain range between present day Czech Republic and Poland, an area that Friedrich had tracked in his youth. Elements of the landscape held strong symbolism for the artist and his audience of that day. There's a th thriving fir tree center left to the right of the hut, which represents vitality, and a dead tree to the left of the fir, which represents mortality. The illuminated hills on the horizon suggest an aspiration toward the promise of eternity. 
It's interesting to compare this work to the paintings of the Hudson River School in the United States, created in the same time frame. Friedrich's painting is a recent acquisition of the museum, and it fills a long-standing gap in our collection. Friedrich's works are rare, and there are only four other paintings by this artist in American museums. His work has, a, has had a deep impact on later generations of German artists, including the great living contemporary German artist, Gerhard Richter. We'll compare this painting to a Richter work uh, later in this presentation. And I'll probably be referring to it a couple of times in comparison to what was being done in, in the early 19th century and how it changed over time. So at the beginning of the 20th century, expressionist art was still unknown in Germany. In 1911, an artist group in Berlin called the New Succession organized an ambitious ex exhibition of recent art from across the country. The city's critics took note. Confronted by a dizzying array of styles, one writer saw a common thread. He claimed that these artists were challenging long-held artistic conventions by rejecting nature as a model for their art. They denounced paintings that simulated natural depth and volume. This new art, which became known as Expressionism, elevated intense color and flatness as paintings' essential features, and it challenged and provoked the conventional wisdom of the day. Carl Schmidt Rotloff was a key figure of Expressionism. And in 1905, he founded an avant-garde group known as The Bridge, inspired by a line from the work of Friedrich Nietzsche, Thus Spake Zarathustra, what is great in man is that he is a bridge and not an end. De Brugge, or the bridge artists, saw their art as a bridge towards the future. In this painting, the artist represents his vista as an abstract pattern of vibrant color, flat shapes and dynamic zigzagging lines rather than a more conventionally naturalistic window onto nature. In the foreground is a red field with flowers that resemble broken eggshell cups. Pointed pines are behind to left and right and red and yellow striped fields appear in the center. If you look further back towards the horizon, you'll see fishermen's cottages, balloon-like trees, and distant expanses of sea, sky, and the fishing vision, village of Naiden, which was then part of the eastern reaches of the German Empire, but today is part of Baltic Lithuania. This work was acquired by the prestigious National Gallery in Berlin after World War I in 1919. So it would have been among Schmidt Rotloff's best known pictures in the 1920s and 1930s. However, in July of 1937, the painting was confiscated by the Nazis and then appeared in the Degenerate Art Exhibition that same year. The Degenerate Art Exhibition was a propaganda device organized by the Nazi government to indoctrinate the German people against expressionist and other modern works. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. This painting was later acquired by the prominent St. Louis collector and department store owner, Morton May, May Department Stores and bequeathed by him to the museum in 1983 as a part of a, his transformative gift of German expressionist paintings 
and other works to the St. Louis Art Museum. Take a good careful look at this painting. It was acquired just last year for 1.8 million pounds sterling. And it's making its St. Louis premiere in this exhibition. This is a work of very high quality by the important expressionist artist, Gabriel Munter. And it's painted in Murnau, Bavaria, the site of the creation of most of her work at a significant time in her development as an artist. It also fills an important gap in the museum's collection of expressionist art. And there's also a wonderful St. Louis connection to Munter. She had family in St. Louis and spent two months visiting them here in 1900. It's really a beautiful painting. Bright red flowers mark a new grave in a Bavarian churchyard. Its scenic landscape and picturesque buildings attracted the artist who bought a home nearby and chose this cemetery as her final resting place. With careful looking, you can see the abstract figures of two nuns in the picture. It was in Murnau that Munter began to create works that transformed scenes of nature into abstract compositions. This painting shows an early stage in that development. So this is a portrait by the American artist Lionel Feininger of his Jewish wife. His crystalline faceted style led critics to call him the German cubist, but Feininger insisted he was an expressionist. He claimed that abstraction liberated his art from imitating nature and freed him to express his feelings. Feininger was one of the few American artists associated with German Expressionism. He was born and grew up in New York, and he traveled to Germany at the age of 16 to study art. His successful career there included teaching at the Bauhaus School for Art, Architecture, and Design. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. After 50 years of living in Germany, Feininger returned to the United States in 1936 to escape Nazi persecution. World War I was a humiliating defeat that shattered the life of every German. Millions died or suffered debilitating physical and psychological wounds. The country lost vast territories and bore devastating reparation payments. The abdication of Emperor Wilhelm II offered hope for political renewal as the empire fell to the first German Republic, whose constitution granted civil liberties that had been denied under imperial rule. The visible world, which seemed so distant in expressionist art before the war, returned with a vengeance. The war also gave rise to a right-wing anti-Semitic conspiracy theater, theory widely believed, even though not actually believable, known as the Dolk Strauss Legenda. The narrative of this myth was that the German army did not lose World War I on the battlefield, but rather that the German army was betrayed by civilians, especially Jews, and that the German people had been, quote, stabbed in the back, close quote. 
The advocates of this narrative denounced the German government leaders who had signed the armistice of no November 11, 1918 as criminals. So this is Karl Hochner's The Homecoming of 1918. For me, this is one of the most powerful and disturbing works in the exhibition. People who have seen the exhibition in person have told me that encountering this work is remarkably wrenching in a way that this slide simply cannot convey. The work shows emaciated and disfigured men, women, and children confronting viewers in a wall of misery. Row upon row, fading into the distance. Even so, even so the raw violence of this painting fails to capture the human cost of World War I. Soldiers experienced the new horrors of mustard gas and shell bombardment, while civilians faced widespread famine and disease. The war radicalized many artists, including Hochner. In this work, Hochner focuses on the massive humanitarian crisis of war. A seemingly unending line of bodies march or limp towards us with an unsettling intensity of need. The where they are coming from and where exactly they are headed is not clear. The gaunt pale figures could be refugees, half alive, or perhaps they are spirits of the dead. The painting is life-size in scale and its acidic tones and harsh contrasts belie complacency. In this unconventional depiction by Max Beckman, Jesus stops an angry mob from stoning a woman to death. The biblical story's message of nonviolence expresses the artist's pacifism after his wartime service in World War I. Beckman volunteered as a medical orderly during the war, but constant exposure to dead and dying soldiers traumatized him. This is one of the first paintings Beckman created after his army discharge in 1917, and it shows his own restrained form of German Expressionism. 20 years after the creation of this painting in 1937, and as, a, as we've already mentioned, the Nazi government would open its degenerate art exhibition, mocking modern art. This exhibition had been conceived by Third Reich Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, to indoctrinate the people against expressionist, abstract, and modern art. Degenerate artists were forbidden from creating or selling their works. They were not permitted to teach. The degenerate exhibition haphazardly exhibited 650 contemporary paintings and sculptures picked from the thousands of works Nazi forces had seized from 32 muse German museums, some only days earlier. In public remarks about the exhibition, which Beckman heard by radio transmission, Adolf Hitler stated that these modern so-called artists should be treated for disorders or as a matter for the criminal courts. One of these works, prominent in the first gallery of the Degenerate Art Ex Exhibition of 1937 was this painting, and it put Beckman in great peril. One scholar has referred to this work as the painting of the death sentences. First and most obviously, it presents a dramatic episode from the Gospel of John, in which Jesus is teaching in Jerusalem's temple, when the Pharisees and scribes 
suddenly confront him with a woman caught in an act of adultery. In John's gospel account, the Pharisees seek to entrap Jesus with a question about imposing the death sentence by stoning on the woman in, an, in adherence with ancient Mosaic law. In the account, Jesus answers, let him among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. The assembly disperses and Jesus dismisses the woman saying, go and do not sin again. But there is a second death sentence exhibited in this work. If you look carefully, there's a spear at 11 o'clock in the painting, which contains three spikes in the form of crosses, revealing the premonition of Jesus' own death by crucifixion. After hearing Hitler's words on the radio, Beckman and his wife fled Germany and spent the remainder of the war under difficult circumstances in the city of Amsterdam. In 1946, Perry Rathbone, who was then the director of the St. Louis Art Museum, arranged for the couple to immigrate to the United States where Beckman taught art for two years at Washington University in St. Louis. The St. Louis Art Museum now owns the largest collection, collection of Beckman paintings in the world. This painting also escaped the Nazis. At the close of the degenerate art exhibition, the painting was sold to a gallery whose owner ultimately gifted it to the St. Louis Art Museum in 1955. The painting occupies a haunting place in the body of work known as de degenerate art. Its message of compassion and defending a Jewish woman against the authorities described something that became impossible in Nazi Germany. Beckman's depiction of death sentences in Christ in the sinner could have resulted in his own. So after 1900, industrialization in Germany advanced with breathtaking speed. Germany at the time produced more steel than any other European nation, and its high quality manufactured goods flooded markets. A major factor in Germany's transformation was its trade schools, where students learned to approach industry with scientific precision. As German engineers elevated industry to an art form, artists explored industrial subjects and materials. Photography was celebrated as an epitome of mechanical art and photographers turned to factories and machines as fitting subjects. Industry drove Germany's economic recovery after World War I, but it soon showed a dark side. Leading companies supported the rise of Nazi party and in return profited from Nazi government contracts and protections. In this work, valve handles soar like forest trees into a landscape of intri and intricate machine parts gleam with perfection celebrating the beauty found in, in industry. For this artist, Albert Renger Patch, these were common sights. He lived and worked as a photographer in the Ruhr River Valley in Northwest Germany near the border of the Netherlands, a coal mining district that powered all of Germany's heavy industries. He photographed factories and machines as aesthetic objects, and he believed the camera's rapid speed and mechanical accuracy 
was the best way to capture their visual power. Another example of industrialization, this table fans sleek brass blades and crisp geometric ornament efficiently express what its designer Peter Behrens called the rhythm of the time. An early advocate for the role of art in industry, Behrens became an artistic consultant at the AEG, a Berlin-based manufacturer of electrical, electrical equipment. He inspired a generation of German architects, including Bauhaus founder, Walter Gropus. So by 1945, Germany had experienced a second catastrophic military defeat, leaving the country again in ruin and rubble. After World War II, a divided Germany emerged as the principal stage upon which cold, the Cold War dramas played out, primarily between the United States and the Soviet Union. This period of geopolitical tension was epitomized by dueling economic systems, Soviet socialism and American-sponsored capitalism. As revelations about the genocide and the extent of Nazi war crimes became more widely disseminated and comprehended, artists began to address the atrocities committed during World War II. In the immediate post-war period, citizens struggled to reckon with their country's responsibility for the Holocaust. Lingering questions of guilt were often pushed aside to aid reconstruction efforts. Many contemporary German artists of this time were children when the war ended. As adults in the 1970s and 1980s, they became the pioneers who confronted the war's traumatic legacy and their parents and grandparents' involvement in the Nazi regime. These artists challenging subject matter purposely laid bare Germany's uneasy relationship with the traumatic wartime period and the murder of millions. So in his hero series, George Baselitz depicted ragged, awkward men traveling through desolate landscapes. Baselitz, who immigrated from East to West Germany in 1957, employed the notion of the hero with satire to evoke both the propagandistic art of the Nazis and socialist realism, the official style of the Soviet bloc. Questioning the nature of heroism in the wake of the Holocaust, Baselitz offers his hero as a metaphor for the deep malaise, both physical and emotional, of Germany's war-torn societies. And here's another baseless work. Note the palette of soft natural tones. This canvas first appears as a gestural abstract painting, but upon more careful looking, you'll see representational subject matter. This is an upside down landscape with the sky and clouds depicted in the lower half of the painting. Baselitz drew inverted images to draw attention to paintings as material objects and not merely windows into scenes. He based this painting on a landscape view of Saxony his native region of Germany. Using a color palette similar to that of the landscape painting of Caspar Friedrich, Sunburst in the Riesengebirge, 
which we considered earlier. Baselitz was interested in using his method of inverting imagery to exam examine the problematic history of German landscape painting and how the Nazis embraced and utilized the German landscape and German aesthetics to glorify the Third Reich. He also wanted to cast a dark shadow on historic artworks and motifs that had been considered typically German. In his paintings, Baselitz confronts the human and cultural tragedies of World War II and how landscapes have been coded and co-opted throughout history as symbols of national and cultural identity. So we're gonna look at two other works briefly from this period. In this work, a black eagle hovers above the German word blot or blood spelled backwards. A.R. Penck was fascinated with the eagle, a longstanding symbol of German national identity. When paired with the word blut, it recalls the trauma of Germany's past, particularly the terror and bloodshed of World War II and the Holocaust. Penck, who lived in East Germany at the time he created this painting, was suggesting a shared German history and the responsibility of Germany to examine its past. And then this painting by Marcus Lupertz. The artist here is challenging viewers to fill in the gaps of the story by connecting the objects depicted to the German motif referenced in the painting's title. Aspects of the composition recall symbols associated with Nazi ideology and elements of German myth and history co-opted by the German party of the time, the Nazi party. This sheaf of wheat and spade in this work would have been associated with the Reichsarbeitsdienst, the RAD, a national Nazi organization intended to indoctrinate youth. So, moving on to the Cold War. In our rapid review of 200 years of German history. After World War II, abstract painting in West Germany was framed as a progressive development towards democracy and freedom. In contrast, realism and figuration were seen as reminiscent of both Nazi era national socialist art and Soviet socialist realism. Nevertheless, artists in both East, East and West Germany overlapped and engaged with a wide variety of styles, exploring the potential of painting to address Germany's past and present. Figuration was revisited and revised through fractured images that broke with historical conventions. As the Cold War persisted into the 70s and 80s, some artists questioned idealistic notions of the universal nature of abstraction. Instead, seeing it as a pointed, critical, and conceptual tool, Germany's physical and political division into East and West became a subject for art as painters represented associated experiences of alienation and disorientation. While socialist realism remained the official style in East Germany, some artists worked outside government systems and created alternative narratives. As the 1980s came to a close, artists embraced an ironic and ambivalent stance on Germany's present and future, unable to anticipate all of the ramifications of the country's impending unification and the fall of the Berlin Wall. 
So in this vibrant, expressive nighttime scene, an elongated figure strides towards the Berlin Wall. A, it's a guarded concrete barrier. It's the wall that separated East and West Berlin from 1961 to 1989, both physically and ideologically. According to the painting's title, the figure is none other than the 19th century Dutch painter, Vincent van Gogh, an artist Fetting, Rainer Fetting admired. Fetting co-founded an artistic run gallery in the Kreuzberg neighborhood of West Berlin, a protective space for alternative lifestyles. His work captured the atmosphere of West Berlin where student protests and what is now known as the LGBTQIA rights movement demanded societal change despite the constraints of the Berlin Wall. As promised, this is Gerhard Richter. This is his painting, Olberg from 1986. In this work, Richter dragged and scraped a spatula slowly over thickly applied layers of paint, allowing various layers of color to show through. What appears to be a spontaneous composition was laboriously worked by the artist to achieve complexity and depth. Richter's cool, methodical approach challenges the emotional charge and spiritual overtone of the abstract tradition, creating a wry commentary on the heroic genius and expressive tendencies in West German art. The title Olberg is interesting. It's the German word for a particular mountain in Jerusalem known as the Mount of Olives. But the word Olberg refers to this Mount of Olives at a particular time, the time of Jesus meeting with his 12 apostles. It's interesting to think of this work as a landscape painting and compare it to Caspar Friedrich's Sunburst in the Reisengebirge from 1935, which we looked at earlier. Richter is one of Germany's most important contemporary artists, and several of his works have set record prices at auction. Born in East Germany, he escaped to the West just two months before the building of the Berlin Wall. He's 88 years old now and lives in Dresden, the city of his birth which as you know, was leveled in one infernal night as World War II crawled to a close. If you're interested, a fictionalized account of his life is beautifully portrayed in the 2018 movie, Never Look Away. The title of this movie may be based on a say saying attributed to Henry David Thoreau, Never Look Back, unless you're planning to go that way. So as the 1980s progressed and the Cold War continued unabated, some German artists became disillusioned with traditional politics and art's role in society. Artists moved beyond monumental paintings and established conventions working instead in a variety of scales and media. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, the East German government announced that the border between East and West Germany was to be opened. With this pronouncement, the Berlin Wall was breached and subsequently destroyed. Less than a year later, on October 3rd, 1990, Germany was reunified and a new chapter of global history began. In this work, the familiar sight of a raised antenna transforms a concrete block into a silent radio. The artist Isa Genskin 
used concrete to reference the cold raw material of post-war reconstruction. World Receiver is subtitled with the name of a street, Brüsselstrasse, in Berlin, evoking the global nature of radio transmission. Radio waves, you see, cannot be blocked by borders or walls. So radio programs became a site of propaganda transmission during the Cold War. The work is part of a series begun by this artist in the early 1990s. The, the castings are in concrete, a material closely associated with post-war architecture. Germans of Genskin's generation grew up in and around modernist housing made from prefabricated concrete slabs that replaced the crumbling ruins left in the aftermath of World War II. The cracks and holes that mark the surface of the concrete in this work are reminiscent of wartime ruins themselves, as well as the effects of time and weather on the cheaply constructed facades of post-war slab buildings. The intentionally roughed surface treatment in Genskin's sculpture highlights the vulnerability of what appears to be a solid and impenetrable material. Concrete was also the material of the Berlin Wall, constructed by East Germany in 1961 to stem the flow of defectors to the West. A symbol of Germany's ideological division, the wall nevertheless could not prevent all communication between East and West Berlin. So I want to close with a work in our collection. It's on view, but it was not included in this special exhibition. It certainly could have been. Anselm Kiefer's Breaking of the Vessels. It is a somewhat figurative but complex work that is rich with layers of historic as well as religious meaning. It's a massive lead sculpture. 12 and a half feet by 17 feet. It's the heaviest object inside the walls of our museum. It consists of shelves containing what appear to be books containing and surrounded by shards of broken glass. Shattered glass is also scattered on the floor at the foot of the sculpture. Keeper's work is in the form of a Jewish Kabbalistic tree of life with labels identifying the 10 spherot or attributes of God from the teachings of the Kabbalah. These attributes, which include compassion, truth, and justice were according to the Kabbalah brought into physical space of the world at a moment of the creation in glass vessels and since the glass vessels were not capable of containing the attributes of God, they shattered. Kiefer's work also presents an image of the attempts throughout history by powerful forces to erase and destroy the identity and the cultural memory of others through religious persecution, political tyranny, and existential threats. Perhaps most obviously, the pogroms of Kristallnacht in 1938 in Germany, the night of broken glass, the event which is considered to mark the beginning of the Holocaust. But another interpretation is the destruction of the second temple in the first century of the common era by the Romans, an event which generally coincides with the beginning of the rabbinic period of Judaism. The destruction of the second temple is often given as an important reason for the decision by the rabbis in response to an existential threat to preserve the oral Jewish law in written books known as the Talmud. Kiefer's work is displayed in our museum's Grand Sculpture Hall, our largest interior space, and the architecture of the hall 
is based on a design of ancient Roman baths of the Emperor Caracalla, built in the late second century, just following the destruction of the second temple. Following the destruction of the second temple, work began on the writing of the Jerusalem Talmud and the reference to books in this work is unmistakable. So as we began, once again, what comes to mind is the theory of history conceived by Walter Benjamin, a storm of progress, this time depicted by the young German artist Anselm Kiefer after the fall of the Berlin Wall, bringing the attributes of God into the world, broken glass, burned books, and destruction as part of a single ongoing catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage, hurled in front of the feet of the angel, this time in the form of a Kabbalistic tree of life. Paul Clay's angel of history would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from paradise, caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into a future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. A storm of progress. So this concludes my presentation, but it's not the end of the story. Progress, you see, is not linear, and history is not preordained. The struggle continues, and museums can serve as stepping stones to understanding, hope, and progress. History and museums are much as much about today and tomorrow as they are about the past. Who owns this narrative? We all do. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You please go ahead and unmute. And let's share questions and comments with, the, with each other for a few moments. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand. Um, you can type in the chat. Um, Sissy? I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you for the presentation. I thought it was fascinating. I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Fran, did you have a question? No. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I don't see any other questions. It was a wonderful program. Wonderful. Oh, Jonathan Daner is giving you a thumbs up. Thank you, Jonathan. I got a question. Um, we do have a question from Phil Miller. Hi, Bill. How many of these artists were Jewish? Uh, very few of them. Uh, I often get the question: uh, Was Max Beckman Jewish? Uh, and he was not. Uh, the, uh, the artists that were persecuted uh, and, and whose work was uh, labeled as degenerate, they didn't have to be Jewish. All they had to do was uh, uh, to depart from the Nazi ideolo the ideology of what was uh, acceptable uh, German art and advancing the uh, the theory of the uh, of the party. Jerry Bamberger, did you have a question? You started to type. We've got a lot of thank yous in the chat. I don't know, um, Bill, if you see them. We have Gloria uh, Queskin, 
Phil uh, and Martha and David, Alyssa Banford, everyone's thanking you so very much for the wonderful program. And I think that we do not have any other questions today. So again, we so enjoyed your program. Thank you so much for, Thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. I had a question. Oh, Carol, okay. Um, Hitler was supposed to have been an artist. Um, what did you think of his artwork? Yeah, you know, there's the story, uh, uh, Lois Rubin, who's on this call, could tell it better than I that uh, uh, Hitler was uh, studying art. And if he had been admitted to art school, history may have been very different. He, he was uh, bitter about his uh, failure to in achieve enrollment. Um, but he recognized uh, very early on uh, uh, the opportunity to use art uh, as uh, a propaganda tool. He, he, he uh, somehow understood the power that. of art to convey ideas. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask my question, but I can't. Well, are there any other questions? Jerry, did you, Jerry Bamberger, did you have a question you wanted to ask or? How do I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that will be it. <laughs> It's not sending. Bill, can you hear me? I need to unmute. Yeah, we can hear you. Who's okay. whoever's talking? I don't know who that is. Hi, this is Helene. I'm um, going back to the painting um, that had the represent uh, with the stalk of weed and the shovel, and um, what I assume was like a, a helmet. What were the other symbols in it that were represent? What What were the other symbols in it? it was the uh, abstract landscape and I don't remember the name of the person who did it or anything. Yeah, uh, so you're asking about um, Marcus Lupert's um, and uh, I don't know that I can identify all of the various symbols. Uh, there's actually uh, one of his works uh, uh, currently on view uh, at the museum that's not a part of the exhibition. Uh, that is done almost entirely in um, uh, olive drab, uh, the, uh, the color that was typically associated with um, military uniforms uh, at the time. Uh, so it, it, it was uh, ju just another way that he used uh, these symbols to struggle with this idea of um, um, what had happened in his country and how could this possibly have happened in his country? And uh, uh, so he was uh, one of this group of artists uh, that uh, came along uh, as a German citizen, but not around during the Holocaust itself that was uh, struggling for um, symbolic ways to get people to think about um, uh, what had happened and, and to face the past. Uh, Baselitz did it with upside down. Uh, the uh, uh, Pank did it with uh, uh, inverted words, uh, Tulb and Blut. Um, just, just the whole idea facing the idea of uh, beautiful German landscapes and uh, uh, that there was more to art uh, than just this. I took one of my clients and when we saw the, uh, uh, the image with the, the blood on it, um, he was uh, half Jewish and had survived in Berlin during the war, the bombing of Berlin. And he just turned white when he saw that painting. It was pretty dramatic. Yeah, uh, Hitler's uh, um, retreat uh, during the war uh, was a place called the Eagle's Nest. 
the the eagle was a very important symbol. Yeah, thank you. Thought provoking and thoughtful. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. And we will end today's program with a great appreciation for you, Bill, on your work that you've done. And hopefully we could see you in person in the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.